Hello and welcome back to Sweeter Than Honey. Uh, we're going to go through the book of Leviticus now, which is something that um, kind of accidentally suggested we should do, but I'm actually really looking forward to it because it's a book which I've never studied in huge detail and I think um, it's very few people do because it's quite it's quite a challenge on face value um, but I'm excited because God speaks through all of his scripture and I'm always amazed whenever I read the Bible and study it in depth with him of just how he speaks and how he opens up so I'm hoping this is going to be really edifying for you really build you up um, and hopefully take away your nervousness about certain parts of the Bible which can seem very, very uh, unapproachable at first. Um, yeah, so Leviticus. Now, whenever I start studying a, a scripture, I have um, a few questions in mind. So many of you who've done Bible studies with me know that I use a plurp Bible study model, that's just a little mnemonic to say we pray, so always pray, always do it with the Holy Spirit. We ask some looking questions, we ask some understanding questions, we see how we're going to respond to this and then we pray again. Um, now I don't mind if you use that or if you just remember the five W's, um, that's another way of just remembering it, um, from, um, from school. So why, sorry don't start with why, where, who, what, when, and then why? The reason why you do why uh, later is because it's an understanding question. Once you've asked the question of when is this written, who's in the story, what's happening, where is this, then you've got a good grounding to say okay and now what does it mean, what do we think? If you just start a bible study and say okay you read the passage together, you pray Lord God help us and then you open up with the question what do you observe in the text? That I found, I used to do that for quite um, a number of years, you led Bible studies um, kind of with that as a model. Um, actually, you miss a lot of what God is really trying to say, what the author is really intending to say. And you can also bring out some kind of spurious things, which then take a bit of time dealing with and discussing over. And so I just find a really simple, easy, way of studying the Bible is just to ask where is this set, when is this set, um, who's in the story, what's happening. Once you've got those, then what does it mean? So Leviticus, when? That's the first question, when? When does it come? So it's quite early on in the Bible, so it's uh, in this Bible that's quite near the beginning. Um, you've had Genesis, Exodus and then Leviticus. So when you can think when in history so it's probably written about 1500 bc or something around about that time when in the story of the bible this is such a crucial one when in the story of the bible is this happening um you've had creation god created uh he formed everything he um gave everything food and, and he set up creation, he made people, he was like this potter moulding things out of the dust and then um, coming and dwelling with his people on the seventh day, resting from his work. That was like the Eden ideal, the Eden temple where people and God dwelt together. Sadly people sinned, they fell. Remember we went through the um, God created, there was the fall that God rescued and um, God made new and that that's the storyline that we're that's the big storyline of the Bible that's the storyline we'll see in all of the parts of the Bible so the fall happened people sinned unfortunately God had to judge them because he's a just God and he sent them out of the garden he clothed them and he sent them out of the garden um, east of Eden and then he doesn't abandon his people doesn't abandon people, he speaks with Cain, he warns him, don't hate your brother, Cain kills his brother Abel, you know, death comes into the human story through strife, through violence, things get so bad, there's the flood narrative, then he chooses one people group, chooses Abram, who becomes Abraham, and he promises him, you're going to bless the nations, through your descendants you're going to bless the nations, at this point, Abram had no descendants, and 
um, we will come on to that story because it links with Leviticus quite closely. We'll come on to that in another session. So he's been promised actually your descendants are going to bless the nations. His descendants uh, end up down in Egypt because there's no food in Canaan where, where God said, I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. But they end up down in Egypt. They're brought out of Egypt through Moses. And this is where Leviticus comes. So they've come out of Egypt. After three months, they were at Mount Sinai. That's in Exodus 19. And now Leviticus is still in the Sinai, Sinai, however you say it, um, <laughs> narrative. So he, uh, Moses has been at the plain of Sinai, where there's this mountain, there's this plain. The people of Israel have been camping out. And in that place, God is forming them as his people. Now, the reason why he has to form them as his people is because they've still got Egypt in them. They've still, they're still thinking about Egypt. They're still, the way that they act, the way that they behave, is still very much how they were as slaves back in Egypt. We find this when they come out of the waters, then immediately you get the story about grumbling. Oh, is God going to feed us? Is he going to, uh, we're thirsty. You sent us out here to die. It was better... It was better back in Egypt. But they're having to learn that actually God provides in a different way. He does things differently to the rest of the world. He's God. He sends them bread from heaven. He sends them water from the rock. He looks after them in a different way. And they've been having to be reshaped. It's a whole mind having to be transformed to become actually his people. And he helps them with this. So he calls them into Mount Sinai, into the plains. Um, Moses goes up the mountain, God comes with thunder, there's a trumpet sound from heaven, there's lightning, the people are terrified, and then he gives Moses ten commandments. Moses goes down the mountain, he gives it to the people, they say, yeah, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna follow God, yeah, definitely, definitely, we're gonna follow God. So he goes back up the mountain this time with 70 elders of the people, and they, the 70 elders, and, uh, Moses and a couple of other people, they actually eat in the presence of God. They see God and yet they weren't consumed. They see God and they see and this like sapphire sea beneath his feet and, and they eat and drink in his presence and they're fine. They're not consumed by his holiness. So they go down the mountain and these guys have seen God. Then Moses goes up again with Joshua and God's going to give him the Ten Commandments and a bunch of other commandments. And he's going to write down the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets so that they've got a record of it that they can see. And he's up there for 40 days. And as he's up there for 40 days, the people down below are thinking, well, he's been gone a while. I mean, I can see the thunder and the lightning and the cloud and stuff, but, um, you know, he could have been gobbled up he could have been consumed he could have died up there I mean well, we don't know what's happened to him and they go to Aaron who uh, Moses left Aaron and her in charge and they go to Aaron and they say look make for us a, look, make for us an image because that's how we know to worship that's how the Egyptians worship that's how we know to worship so make for us an image God had literally just given them the commandment of don't make an image don't make an image of God why because you are the image of God back in Genesis one and two, we're told explicitly people are the image of God. We're not to make another image. We're the image. But they were thinking Egyptians still. They're still thinking, oh, you make an idol and that's how, that's how you worship. So they're still in this mindset. And they make this carved idol, this carved, uh, sorry, this calf, this golden calf. And it was Aaron's idea. He really gives into peer pressure. And the a horrible irony of it is that as he's doing this God is giving Moses instructions about how to build a tabernacle where the priests where Aaron and his sons are going to serve before God and he tells them how they're going to be consecrated how they're going to be made holy how they're going to be set apart for his work and as he is being given these instructions Aaron is at the bottom of the mountain 
giving into peer pressure, giving the people what they want, saying, yeah, yeah, bring me your gold. And, oh, and then he comes down when Moses gets angry, he comes down. And Aaron is like, oh, I threw the gold in the fire and out popped a calf. Oh, whoops, it wasn't me kind of thing. I'm like, no, it totally was. <laughs> Didn't just throw it in the fire and out popped a calf. It was, <laughs> you know, like he's so, he's guilty. And yet God's merciful to him. And you've got this tension in the story of these people that are continually rebellious, even as God is making them his covenant people and God being merciful. But there is still judgment. But And actually, when uh, when God saw what was happening down at the bottom of the mountain, he said to Moses, look, I'm going to I'm going to wipe these people out. I'm going to start again with you because they are just they're stiff necked people. They're not obedient. I'm going to wipe them out. And Moses says, no, don't do that. Please. I know they're stiff-necked. I know they're rebellious. I know. He says, he confesses all their sin. Yeah, they are sinful. They are really sinful. They do not deserve your mercy. But please have mercy. Think about what the Egyptians will think when they see, oh, you took them out of the wilderness and then they died in the wilderness. What will they think? He's concerned. Moses is concerned both for God's reputation in the nations because he realises that actually these people aren't just God's covenant people for their own sake. They're God's covenant people for the nations. The nations need to know what this God is like. But there's this tension in the story that actually God is calling. He needs to have a holy people. He needs to have a covenant people. So how is it going to be that God can actually dwell with this people? He gives them a tabernacle, a way of them, this temple area, this Eden-like area where they can come in and be with God. But at the end of Exodus, when they've made this, not even Moses can go in. When they've created it, when they made the, the tabernacle and it was finished, God came and dwelt in the tabernacle. His presence was manifestly, powerfully there holy made it holy by coming into it but not even Moses can enter so now you've got a problem <laughs> you've got God in the midst of the people in this tabernacle but he is so holy and the people so unholy that not even Moses can go in no one can go in no one's holiness is is enough to go in and that's where the book of Leviticus comes into the story. It's in the first month, so at the end of Exodus we're told, then the, then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting on the first day of the first month, place the ark of the testimony in it and shield the ark with the curtain. And then it goes on and at the end it says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day. And fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the house of Israel during all their travels. So you've got this tabernacle. It's all there made exactly as God said. They had been obedient, hallelujah. They'd made it exactly as God had said. But no one can go in. So God gives them a way of coming in. And that's where we get to all the laws in Leviticus, which we're going to dive into in the next session we're on Mount Sinai, they've been there nine months, and now they're going to find out what do we have to do so that we can actually come in and be with this God. Because we are so unholy, if we come in, we will be consumed. We will, we will die in his presence. We are that unclean, that unholy. So how is God going to deal with this problem? And that's where we get to Leviticus. So that's your introduction. Let's go on the journey together. Father, thank you for Leviticus. Thank you that you made a way, that there was a way of people living with God, even in our unholiness, in our fallen state. There was a way that you rescued us such that we can dwell with a holy God. And I pray that as we come into this, uh, dive into this story, that you will be revealing your heart for your people, revealing truth, revealing your mercy, your grace, revealing your good and just judgment, revealing our sin, 
revealing your holiness and revealing the wonder of what Christ achieved on the cross. In the name of Jesus. Amen. There is joy, there is peace, there is power.